Good morning. morning. It's good to see you, and it's good to have another day of life on earth with a view towards the kingdom. Pretty soon, we're going to have an election. Whether I can get this turned on or not, it's going to happen. I did. Ah, it's on. You know God votes too? Probably all of us in here by now have an idea in mind of who we're going to vote for, how our vote's going to go. I didn't realize until I looked in the paper uh, last week that there are so many things on the ballot. But what I want to talk about this morning are not all the issues about the questions that we're going to be faced with and decisions to be made regarding legislation that pays for this or pays for that. And I can't get this thing to come up. It comes up and then it goes off. It's got the same slide. How? What's that? It came up again, but see, it just went off. I don't know why it does that. The Apostle Paul never had this problem. And I know I'm not the Apostle Paul. Thank you very much. I'm the elder Marty. It comes up. Okay, we'll go back to this. I'm a little more familiar with this. Let's see what happens now. There. Now what's it say? If God were going to the polls with us next month, what do you suppose would be his priorities in looking for a national leader? I've got priorities, you have priorities, but the real question is what are God's priorities? You think he's got priorities? Thank you, sir. You think it matters to him who we're going to elect? And primarily this is about our presidential election. I think it matters. Here's some questions for us to consider. And I've thought long and hard about this lesson. I've been wanting to preach about this for a long time, but I thought, my goodness, what am I going to say? Because politics for us is such a a divisive issue. I'm talk, not talking about us as members of the Lord's kingdom, but us as Americans. But I do want us to think of ourselves as members of the Lord's kingdom this morning. Should we vote like citizens of this world, or should we cast our ballots like citizens of the kingdom of God? I think that's a question worthy of consideration. And I think you know the answer to that. It's pretty obvious. Every single one of us who claim to be members of the kingdom of God ought to vote as though we are members of the kingdom of God. Should I vote for or should I vote against a candidate simply because he is a Republican? The answer to that would be, duh. You don't vote for somebody because of their political affiliation. There are political affiliations. I almost wish that weren't so. But to vote, you have to register as one or the other. You've got to vote as a Republican or a Democrat or a, uh, an Independent you got to pick a team, so to speak. But when it comes to voting, I don't think it's right to vote for the party. I think what we ought to do is vote for the things that God would consider important in a man. Should I vote for or against a candidate simply because he's a Democrat, independent, libertarian, etc.? Same question, really, just with different possibilities. You don't vote for somebody because of their political affiliations. At least I don't think we should. Should I vote for or against a candidate because they are white? This time, like last time, well, oh, we got a white guy running against a black guy. Oh, should that make a difference? Shouldn't make any difference at all. What color were Adam and Eve? I've seen the pictures. I know they're white folks. At least I thought that was true until I visited a black congregation of the Lord's Church and they had some pictures on their wall and their Adam and Eve were black. They even had a black Jesus. Should I vote for or against a candidate because they're black? Same question, really. And for members of the kingdom of God, it should not make any difference whatsoever. 
black or white? Should I vote for or against a candidate based on gender? I'll tell you something right now, and some of you might feel like I do. If, if Condoleezza Rice ran for president, and if she wrote her name in right now, I'd vote for her. What are God's priorities? Now, there's not a book, chapter, and verse you can go to in Scripture that says, here's what God's looking for in a political contest. But I think there are all kinds of things in Scripture that will show us what he's looking for. When you go back in history to the days of Israel and Judah, the separate kingdoms, and look at the kings that reigned, there were really only two things that God considered about them. For some it was written, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. For others it was written, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. God never made commentary about their ability to boost the economy. God never worried about their ability to have or not have a strong military. Those kinds of things were never the issue. Foreign policy was never a question. When you go back and look at the kings of Israel and Judah, God was only concerned about one thing, and that was their relationship with him and how they led the people in their relationship with him. Somebody might say, Marty, this is America. This isn't Israel. Is it really any different in any nation? Should members of the kingdom of God look for the most godly candidate or at least a candidate that will lead the nation in the most godly path? Is that an issue today? I think it's an issue today. I think it should always be an issue. This gives us an idea of what God was looking for in leaders then, and I think it gives us a very good idea of what God's looking for in leaders now. Josiah, perhaps you've heard the name, perhaps you know his story, perhaps you don't. He was perhaps the greatest reformer in Judah in the days of the kings. This is part of the text that Colby read for us just a little bit ago. This is said of Josiah. Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. Would you say Josiah was a pretty good king? I would say based on this that Josiah was a pretty good king. Now, what were the things about Josiah that made him a pretty good king? What were the evidences in his life that prove this passage to be true? Now, there were more than two, but there are two specific ones that I want to bring up because they seem to, to bring us right to the issues that are at heart today in this election we're facing. What did Josiah do? Number one, he broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes. Does that have anything to do with our upcoming election? You know it does. Not that we have male cult prostitutes in the same sense they had then, but we're talking about, if you've got a King James translation, sodomites. Not a very pleasant sounding word, is it? Where did it come from? Well, it goes all the way back to Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah and the practice of the people there. That's where the term comes from. There are still sodomites in the land. Josiah was a great reformer. One of the things he did was he got rid of the sodomites. Another thing he did was he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire from Molech. You say, Marty, we never heard of Molech. We don't know what a Molech is. What in the world does Molech have to do with this election? Well, you might know who Molech is. You may have heard of Molech. Molech was the god who was represented by a great metal image and that image had a place in the back for a fire to be built and that fire would be large enough to get that metal image red hot and when that image was red hot with the fire that had been built in the back of it on the extended arms of that idol would be laid the tiny infant babies of those who worshipped could you imagine the twisted thinking that would compel someone to take a living child and to put it to death in such a manner. What's that got to do with this election? You probably know. Abortion. These two moral issues are huge in my estimation. And I'd like to think they're huge in my estimation simply because and purely because and only because they seem to have been huge in God's estimation. This isn't about politics. I'll tell you something right now, if, if the things were reversed, if Mitt Romney was espousing homosexuality being made 
free and being put in our laws so to uh, accommodate that kind of practice. If marriage was going to be changed by the Republican candidate, and if Barack Obama was saying, hey, we need to stop killing our children while they're still in the womb, and we need to stop this perverse, uh, perverse sexual practice, I'd, I'd vote for Obama in a heartbeat. It has nothing to do with being a Republican. It has nothing to do with being a Democrat or an Independent or a Green Party or a Tea Party or whatever party you're part of. For us, it ought to have one question bearing down on us. What should a member of God's kingdom do? Copied this from their website, Democratic website. So I'm not making anything up. I want you to know this. This is one of their top platform issues. Freedom to marry. We support the right of all families to have equal respect, responsibilities, and protections under the law. We support marriage equality and support the movement to secure equal treatment under law for same-sex couples. We also support the freedom of churches and religious entities to decide how to administer marriage as a religious sacrament without government interference. Casting everything in Scripture aside, even casting away 6,000 years of human history, one of their platform issues is to restructure, to redefine marriage for Americans. What do you think? Another part of their platform, protecting a woman's right to choose. The Democratic Party strongly and unequivocally supports Roe versus Wade. You know what Roe versus Wade's about, unless you've been living under a rock for the past four decades. No, I didn't mean that to sound bad. If you don't know what it's about, ask me. It's all about abortion. This includes a safe and legal abortion. They talk about this as a right. How many of you have six-month-olds or, or one-year-olds that sometimes get on your nerves? Or a 20-year-old? <laughs> it would be ridiculous to think, wouldn't it? Uh, we'll just kill them. They're an inconvenience. They're expensive. We'll just kill them. What's the difference whether they're in the womb or out of the womb? If you've been to a high school biology class, you already know that it's called conception when the sperm and the egg come together. If the sperm is human and the egg is human, what kind of life will there be at conception? Human life. Does it have a soul? I don't know for sure one way or the other, but I know when David wrote in the 139th Psalm, he said, the Lord knew my days before there were any of them. Jeremiah wrote in the first chapter of his prophetic word that God knew him before he was born. When you read in Luke about what Luke wrote about John the Baptist and, and Mary, of course, Elizabeth was John the Baptist's mom, but when, when Elizabeth came into Mary's presence, being six months pregnant with John the Baptist, it says, John, in the womb, leaped for joy in his mother's womb. That's a baby. That's a human being. And I don't believe that John the Baptist or Jeremiah or David are any different from any other human being. We know that life begins at conception. And we know it's human life. What are we doing with it? CDC, what's that stand for? Center for Disease Control. I wanted to get some statistics, and so I, I went to Google and I looked for some statistics on abortion. And most of the statistics that came up on the first few pages were from anti-abortion groups. I don't want to use statistics from somebody who's already against it. I want to use statistics from somebody who doesn't have any stake in the issue one way or the other. So I went to the Center for Disease Control. In 2007, which was the last year for which they had statistics, and I don't know why it, it, it goes back that far, but 827,000 abortions were reported in 2007. 827,000. You know how many troops we lost in Vietnam? About 59,000. 
soldiers fighting against people who are shooting at them. 59,000, that's a horrible number to lose in a war. Interestingly enough, if, if you look back to Gettysburg, we lost about that many in three days fighting at Gettysburg. But in 2007, 827,000 aborted children. 231 abortions per 1,000 live births. That means for every five babies you see born, statistically, one of them wasn't. Statistically speaking, that's 2,267 abortions a day. That means today, before today's over, there will probably be over 2,000 babies aborted. Does that bother you? Well, the question is not really, does it bother us? The question is, does it bother God? I can't imagine anything flying more in his face than to say, God, we thank you for the marvelous blessing of giving us the ability to procreate, to, to bring life into this world. Here's what we're going to do with it. We're going to kill 20% of them before they even make it to daylight. What do you think? I hope by now you realize, if, if you might have had any doubts, this is not about being a Republican. It's not about being a Democrat. It's not about being an Independent. It's about being a citizen of the kingdom of God. How in the world can we ask God to bless America and cast our vote for the acceptance of perversion and the freedom to kill the unborn? Are there other issues? Well, of course there are other issues. The devil always wants us to get caught up in the other issues. But when we look at what's before us, is there anything more blatantly obvious than that these are two issues about which God would care very much. I want to close with two passages. One from Psalms 33. Psalm 33, we'll read verses 11 and 12. The psalmist says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Why is that? Because his counsel is going to stand forever and ever. His counsel still stands today. The other passage, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. The things we've been talking about this morning, it's not politics. It's about righteousness. Righteousness does what? It exalts a nation. What is sin? It's a disgrace. I remember... Somebody asking Ronald Reagan, Mr. Reagan, why did you leave the Democratic Party? Anybody know what he said? He said, I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left me. And this isn't about anti-Democratic Party. At the moment, at the moment, they are the party espousing these views. But if you're a Republican... Don't you get lifted up with any arrogance about this because in a decade or two, things could reverse. Who knows what it's going to be like? This is not about politics. It's never been about politics. It's about what's right. You cast your vote according to what you think God would do. You cast it with all your heart, with all your might. You know, this country has seen some dark days before. We'll probably see some dark days again. But if we see dark days, I want to be able to know for myself, I voted for the bright days. I voted for the better days. I voted for life. I voted for righteousness. I voted for purity. I didn't vote for the Republican Party. I voted for what I believe God saw as right. We're going to stand up and sing a song of encouragement and invitation.
I hope you're proud to be an American. But if you die an American, you can die lost. I hope what you really see as a value is citizenship in the kingdom of God. You die outside the kingdom of God, there is no hope. But this morning, you have every opportunity to come into the kingdom. Jesus died for you just like he died for all the rest of us. Shed his blood to pay for your sin. It's a simple process. Put your faith in him. Repent of your sin. Confess his name and let someone bury you in water, reenacting his death. And you'll be resurrected in reenactment of his resurrection. You'll be part of the kingdom. If that's what you'd like to do this morning, or if you need the prayers of this congregation, or if there's anything we can do for you, we want to know about it. Just let us know by coming forward while we sing together.